The Federal Communications Commission is crafting its policy of freedom of speech and action on the internet, known as net neutrality. Chicago played host to a recent series of lectures on this topic. We'll now see the fourth and final part in this series of lectures as an extended segment. Welcome to Omega. This is the fourth of four lectures on net neutrality. And we covered a lot in these lectures. We reverted, we reviewed the definition and details of net neutrality. We reviewed the definition of the term, why it's necessary, and what's at stake in the fight. We've looked at the history of net neutrality in policy, in law, in the courts, and in the court of public opinion. We've now come to today, the summer of 2014. On May 15, 2014, as was mentioned before in previous lectures, the FCC approved the docket. This will mark the third time that the FCC will attempt to craft policy on net neutrality provisions with the previous two times defeated in court. In a significant development, the FCC has included Title II classification, the formal policy involving public service, common carriage, and non-discrimination among the policy options included in the notice for proposed rulemaking. This development is a credit to what is arguably the largest number of comments, an estimated 3.4 million so far, who commented on the FCC on net neutrality in what appears to be the most of any single issue in the agency's history. The FCC will accept initial comments on the docket until July 15, 2014. From July 14, 15, 2014 through September 15, 2014, the FCC will accept replies to those initial comments. You can comment through the FCC's website at www.fcc.gov slash comments or use the handy online forms available at www.savetheinternet.com one of the coalitions that has been working on net neutrality in recent years and in the past. If you do nothing else on this matter, I strongly encourage you to comment and ask, demand, that the FCC reclassify the internet as a Title II telecommunications service. I would like to address a point now regarding all this activism and the futility that might be perceived around it. A lot of non-activists, and even a number of activists who disdain getting involved in matters of policy, will understandably scoff at getting involved in matters of trying to influence, influence government policy. There is reason to be cynical. The FCC, as the record long shows, is more a handmaiden of corporate power than an advocate of the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Officials at the FCC, far more often than not, use the FCC as a stepping stone to positions within corporate media and aligned industries, positions that are much higher paid and with far less critical scrutiny or awareness. But we have also seen that corporate power can be defeated. Recall the media ownership by the 2003. The comments that were submitted to that docket, both in their quantity and their quality, were exactly the reason why the lawsuit that overturned the media ownership rule demolition that the FCC tried was successful. Andy Schwartzman, an attorney who argued that suit in 2003, recalled the comment by the judges at the time that a million people, in quotes, wound up actually being more like three million people, but a million people commented on the docket in some way, and that that flood of commentary should matter, and that therefore we, they, block the FCC rule rewrite, which they would have otherwise seen billions of dollars of sweeping mergers and acquisitions across our entire media landscape in just a few months. But ask yourself, how did millions of people know about the docket to comment on it, where before the major media who sought to cash in on the rewrite were effectively mute on the matter in the run-up to the FCC's vote? In sum, it was because of growing activist efforts in communities across America who saw what was coming and who raised the alarm in every way that they, we, could. Predictions be damned. Those activists also caught a number of lucky breaks along the way, and the FCC's short-lived policy victory wound up being a pyrrhic victory and ultimately into a full-fledged defeat. We could see something similar on the FCC's docket on net neutrality. The numbers are certainly there for a populist-fueled victory, with possibly more numbers to come. And there are promises of a lawsuit, regardless how the ruling slants. The problem for net neutrality advocates is that, as we've seen, using the courts to defend net neutrality without a reclassification of the internet 
are probably not going to work. But fortunately, that's now abundantly clear. What's more, given the threat that a reclassification would have regarding certain public services, for example, the use of voice over IP telephone for 911 emergency calls, as is increasingly the case, it becomes all the more necessary to reclassify the internet to prevent the kind of degrading service for profit that net neutrality advocates fear might happen. This is why some analysts think that the FCC eventually will come around to reclassifying the internet back into a Title II framework. But predictions about the fate of net neutrality aside, we should not rest on our laurels, regardless how the net neutrality wars of 2014 turn out. The reason is that there are deeper issues at play that also tie into net neutrality, and I'd like to devote the remainder of this lecture to addressing some of those issues. In brief, I'd like to address the reactive nature of political activism, the role and fate of markets in the net neutrality fight and in society more generally, and the critical juncture, the rare opportunity that we face in our current time. As we've seen, the fight over net neutrality has been punctuated by intense times of great activity, like the fight over the COPE Act of 2006 and the net neutrality wars of 2014. But my point here is that such activism is less about being active and more about being reactive. It seems that we're always fighting to stop something, usually policies that are driven by corporate diktat. Seldom are we setting the timetable or, heaven forbid, setting the agenda. Please note, what I'm about to discuss gets us somewhat removed from the discussion of net neutrality, but the matters are clearly connected. Corporations that have a stranglehold on our political process and the possible fate of net neutrality and by extension of the internet and the future of our communications, and for that matter, most everything on earth, it's critical. Just ask any environmental activist, ask most any activist. The aim of a corporation that's faithful to its charter is continual growth at the expense of everything else, even if, especially if, it leaves destruction, sometimes death in its wake, just like a cancer. But actual physical cancers include at least some potential concern for the cause of that cancer, the carcinogen. Continuing with this metaphor for a moment, if a corporation is a cancer, what is the carcinogen? There are clearly a number of factors that are playing that cement the prized position of corporations in our day and age, certainly in the United States. The Corporation, a documentary film and namesake book by Joel Bakken, delves into some of the history on this. But there is one potential carcinogen, a major factor affecting the oversized influence of corporations and impacting the fate of net neutrality and much else, whose criticism is as big a taboo as any in our day and age. I'm talking about markets. Markets, the main allocation mechanism of our economy and of the world economy, where buyers and sellers compete against each other, as do buyers against other buyers and sellers against other sellers, with prices serving as a mark of bargaining power. It is regarded as an article of faith, practically, that all this competition engendered by markets is a good thing, that the proverbial invisible hand will guide good results out of these competitive interactions. And yet, the candle lit by market faith is blown out by the evidence. We see that across industries, across sectors of the economy, markets concentrate. Over time, fewer and fewer producers hold more and more control. And given the market dynamics at play, that makes sense. In an economy where you either eat or be eaten, it makes sense to be a monster. And a corporation is the political economic equivalent of a monster. If criticizing markets for good reason is taboo, then so is calling for the abolition of markets and the replacement with a more participatory economy that won't result in these corporate monsters holding disp disproportionate sway over the internet and over our lives and over the planet. Yes, we should call for, we should demand that the FCC reclassify the internet as a Title II telecommunication service. But should we win the net neutrality wars of 2014? That won't stop the looming threat of corporations hovering over everything, constantly reacting to everything, ready to roll back our hard-fought wins. We need to stop playing defense, constantly reacting to everything that corporations do. We need to start playing on offense by calling for a better economy that would make these life-threatening and net neutrality-threatening corporations shrivel and die. Getting into the details of what that kind of economy would work, would look like, should work, would require probably at least another four lectures. 
But for the time being, I would recommend two books for people interested in exploring this topic. One, the book Of the People, By the People, The Case for a Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel. Two, the book Real Utopia, Participatory Society for the 21st Century, edited by Chris Spanos, which I should say in the interest of disclosure, I helped to contribute a chapter to. I'll admit that this proposal, abolishing the markets that spawn corporations in order to help preserve net neutrality, might seem to some people a bit extreme, maybe even unrealistic, to which I would say, yes, of course it's extreme and unrealistic. Realism in this context is just another word for cynicism. Many of the winds of social justice in contemporary times were deemed in advance to be unrealistic. Ripping the veneer of legitimacy off our financial system in 2011 with a ragtag effort called Occupy Wall Street was unrealistic. Stopping the FCC's media ownership rule demolition in 2003 with an unparalleled mass uprising was unrealistic. Stopping the World Trade Organization's Seattle Round in 1999 with massive and concerted street protests was unrealistic. The list can go on. In fact, I dare say now that I dare say that now is the time, more than ever, to pose the most unrealistic proposals you can think of. And there's a reason why. Social change doesn't always happen in a linear fashion. Sometimes it can get very dramatic and very deep and very fast. These opportunities for deep social change have to do with what are called critical junctures. These are once-a-generation opportunities for deep, dramatic, and quick social change. But these opportunities don't last very long, perhaps a decade or two. I'll quote, a link, I'll quote at length from a book that discusses the idea in detail. Communications Revolution, Critical Junctures and the Future of Media by Robert McChesney. McChesney writes, quote, The decisions made during such a critical juncture establish institutions and rules that likely put us on a course that will be difficult to change in any fundamental sense for decades or generations. When it comes to the history of telecommunications technology, McChesney further writes that critical junctures in media and communications tend to occur when at least two, if not all three, of the following conditions hold. One, there is a revolutionary new communication technology that undermines the existing system. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. And three, there is a major political crisis, severe social disequilibrium, in which the existing order is no longer working and there are major movements for social reform. In the past century, McChesney continues, critical junctures in media and journalism occurred three times. In the progressive era, when the journalism was in deep crisis and, overall, and the overall political system was in turmoil around the year 1900. In the 1930s, when the emergence of radio broadcasting combined with public antipathy to commercialism against the backdrop of the Depression. And in the 1960s and 70s, when popular social movements in the United States provoked radical critiques of the media as part of a broader social and political, political critique. I believe that we are in another critical juncture now. Two of the circumstances are undeniably in place. One, a revolutionary new communications technology that undermines the existing system, the internet. Check. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. America's journalism was asleep at the switch on the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Great Recession of 2008, the Great NSA privacy invasion, among many, many other stories, while our extant newspapers are collapsing and journalists are getting laid off in droves. Check. Is there a major political crisis, part of the third criterion for a critical juncture? Is there severe social equilibrium in which the existing order is no longer working? Same part of that third criterion. Again, these are debatable points. What's the threshold for severe social disequilibrium? But it is clear that things are and have been out of whack. I just mentioned some examples of this. Are there major movements for social reform? Again, a debatable point. When does something qualify as a major movement? But things do trend in this direction, without a doubt. Despite the suppression of the Occupy Wall Street movement, many of those active in the Occupy movement are still active on various initiatives, even if those, even if those efforts are not widely known. Those efforts are coupled by growing and active efforts on, you name it, immigrant rights, economic justice and living wage efforts, 
the environment, particularly the climate crisis, LGBT rights, justice along gender lines, media reform, media justice, the list goes on. So it seems we've come close if we're not already at our trifecta, our hat trick, our triple crown, the three circumstances that are emblematic of a critical juncture. So is that it? Will positive societal change now simply play itself out with net neutrality being one of those changes? I'm inclined to say not quite. While there's coordinated efforts, while there's a lot of motion on various fronts, no denying that, there's little in the way of coordinated efforts towards some grand unifying end. These efforts, all of them, need to s some center of gravity around which to rotate, to crystallize, to coalesce. Again, Robert McChesney, along with co-author John Nichols, make this point in a book called Dollarocracy. McChesney and Nichols write in Dollarocracy, quote, there is more than sufficient demand for reform, and there are more than sufficient reforms under consideration. But to our view, there is an insufficiency of focus. There needs to be a unifying theme that will galvanize the movement and enhance its power. From this enhanced power, and only from such enhanced power, can foundational democratic reforms emerge. This is the last great challenge in shaping the current movement for reform into a necessary transformational politics." End quote. McChesney and Nichols suggest as their unifying theme the act of voting that has animated so much political activism throughout American history. I myself have offered a second potential theme, the abolition of markets and their replacement with a more participatory economy. Doing that, I surmise, would decapitate the corporations that threaten net neutrality and much else besides. No doubt others can and have offer other themes, to which I say, please do, and let the debate begin. The sooner we can argue through these potential unifying themes during this rare opportunity, this critical juncture, the sooner we can coalesce around one, the sooner we can enhance our growing power, the sooner we can change the world for the better and help net neutrality along the way. In the short term, again, I encourage you to contact the FCC, so ask, demand, that they reclassify the Internet as a Title II telecommunications service 